uh, okay um, like always uh, this class is being recorded uh, everyone okay so let me share the cam my cam with you too so can you see me too okay good so all set we're uh, starting a new chapter and a new play okay the play that we have tonight and tomorrow because we have a class tomorrow also uh, is the Duchess of Malfi by a Shakespeare's contemporary by the name of John Webster uh, while um, talking about Othello we had reference uh, or many references rather to, to this play um, in terms of the affinities and the connections and the similarities that, that, that the two plays uh, have in common. We spoke enough about that. Uh, we're likely to also go back to Othello from, t from time to time and highlight uh, points of similarity uh, between the two plays because make no mistake about it they uh, they seem to be inspired or they seem to have been inspired by similar circumstances and similar sets of traditions uh, again we're reading the two plays against the age and the age happens to be uh, the elizabethan age and the J jacobian age okay that when when i say the jacobian age uh, i'm referring uh, of course to the to the to the reign of James the first we'll talk more about James the first and other stuff in in a minute um, <clears throat> okay so people I don't know whether you guys have gone through the play whether you have read the play or not uh, perhaps you are be, be busy with Othello which is uh, quite understandable because of how uh, full of ideas Othello uh, is or has always been um, okay so some some of you are saying that they are uh, some of you have watched it on YouTube and others are saying yes we're uh, a, a summary of it uh, this is good this is good this is nice so it's time that you started reading uh, the original text uh, because this is what our classes uh, are obviously about. It's about encouraging you to read the original text. So um, don't um, allow yourself to forego the pleasure of reading uh, the original text. I know the temptation is sometimes very powerful and very strong. I mean, why would I invest hours and hours reading something that is not even written in modern English why don't I go to the summary right away no this is not what uh, English literature uh, is designed or meant to be it's it's about appreciating uh, the language and this is something that you cannot capture in a summary of course you, you guys are all familiar with these ideas anyway uh, like I said it's John Webster this time uh, around and it's the Duchess of Malfi. Um, <clears throat> um, I, while doing some research on and about the play, I came up with a, a Wikipedia entry that sums up the whole idea. Uh, of course, I'm not an advocate of Wikipedia, and I think they uh, oversimplify things but uh, I thought we need to kind of start with, with some kind of uh, a quick uh, something that sums up the idea and then we delve into the details and we explore every facet of the play uh, in, on our own um, okay so what is it that I read and quote my eye it's the idea you can see that, of course, right? Um, okay, what does it say? It says that the Duchess of Malfi um, is a Jacobian revenge tragedy. So it's a, a revenge tragedy. 
that belongs to the Jacobian age. The Jacobian age is uh, um, the age that came immediately after uh, the Elizabethan age. So more or less, uh, it has the same conventions and the same the same uh, set of traditions, if you like. Um, okay, so it's a revenge tragedy. So we need to unpack what revenge tragedy is. We 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 touched on that when we spoke about Othello, if you still remember. But we'll give it we'll we'll give it more uh, perhaps force because we'll kind of analyze it and break it to its uh, basic tenets and basic components. So revenge tragedy, and written by uh, the English dramatist John Webster. And John Webster uh, was a contemporary to Shakespeare, but he was much younger, of course. Um, what else um, caught my eye? So the, the play begins as a love story when the Duchess marries beneath her class. This is actually what the entire play is about. It's the idea of marrying beneath one's class, whether this is acceptable or not. Uh, remember, we're talking about uh, the idea of the great chain of being. We're talking ag again about the idea of established order, um, you know, hierarchies that you have to uh, step to and respect and honor. Uh, so uh, it's a love story uh, that has this idea of marrying beneath one's uh, class. And it ends, um, or the end, and ends as a nightmarish tragedy, as her two uh, two brothers and uh, the the two uh, brothers of the Duchess undertake the revenge, destroying themselves in the process. So again, it has all the characteristics of a revenge tragedy, where you do something and somebody takes revenge uh, from you, and the whole uh, fabric. Uh, of the family or the house or even the entire country uh, collapses because of this uh, revengeful tragedies that all the characters undertake. Um, <clears throat> okay, so if we say it's a revenge tragedy, if we say that it has uh, plenty of blood, we uh, cannot uh, overlook the fact that this was all the influence of a Roman playwright by the name of Seneca. Spoke about Seneca when we first introduced Othello, and we said also, uh, or if Othello is considered a, a revenge tragedy, it is also going to be the influence of the Roman playwright uh, Seneca. It's the same traditions, mind you, and it's Seneca again. So this is basically what caught my eye about this summary. Uh, of the play in three or four very uh, capsulized statements. We'll now go to the de details. <clears throat> okay, so again, this is chapter three, John Webster, the Duchess of Malfi, and we're dealing with love and marriage in the Malfi court. Okay, so the ideas that we're going to talk about uh, tonight are um, ideas that have to do with love and marriage within the court of Malfi. So Malfi is obviously a dukedom or a kingdom in Italy. And um, it has, of course, a royal court and it has people and they have, you know, they act and interact and will have insights into uh, how uh, is the court co uh, I mean operating in in this uh, dukedom or, or in this principality or kingdom okay so the aspect that we're handling today is uh, the aspect of love and marriage um, uh, before I forget I would like to talk about um, the other so some people raised raised the issue of originality whether we're talking about Othello uh, I'm sorry whether we're talking about Shakespeare or Webster the fact that we have noticed that 
Othello's uh, settings um, are not England or any uh, any place uh, close or near uh, cl uh, close to England or near in England. It's uh, in Italy, Venice, if you still remember Venice and Cyprus. Uh, this time around, we also have uh, a court that is not English. Um, and it's, I mean, the names of the characters tell us that they, uh, <clears throat> they are not also English. So what is this fascination of, uh, or with, uh, um, you know, stories that are not originally English? Is it, um, why? Why would Shakespeare and Webster and others do that? Do they have reasons enough not to create in their own plots and their their own original plots um, actually uh, they were kind of uh, if you have a drama and you uh, and it is based on uh, and is inspired by events in the age uh, and in your time there is this likelihood that you get um, hunted and hunted on on its account I mean the, the authorities will uh, detect similarities between what is you're presenting and what is ha happening in society in in the country and if you're criticizing them it becomes a problem for you so in order to evade and avoid this uh, um, Shakespeare and his colleagues would go all the way to other uh, countries and they get uh, plots and they get stories and names and places that are foreign to the English so that um, when the authorities uh, detect similarities uh, they would say no uh, this is taken from Italy this is taken from uh, Roman or Greek history and uh, if there are similarities it's it's mere coincidence and it's mere uh, accident we didn't mean it okay so this is basically why uh, they have uh, this uh, reliance on 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 foreign stories they were trying to avoid uh, being uh, you know ent entangled in in legal matters okay so this is happening here in the duchess of malfi so malfi is obviously if not Italian, for it is a European uh, principality or dukedom. Um, okay, so again, it's love and marriage in the Malfi court. So where are we? Are we uh, in the streets of Malfi? No, we're not in the streets in Malf uh, of Malfi. We are in the court, in the royal court of Malfi, where um, you normally have what? You have... Uh, you have princes, you have uh, people who work, uh, I mean, uh, government officials, you have stewards, you have uh, chiefs of staff. So you don't have, normally you don't have uh, common people. And if you have common people, they have access to the royal palace because they work there as uh, perhaps... Uh, you know, maids and maid servants, and and those are even very well picked. It's not just any ordinary, ordinary low-born uh, citizen. They have to be uh, chosen uh, very well. So, in in terms of uh, characters and the dramatic persona that we have, we have <coughs> the Duchess the Duchess herself, the Duchess of Malfi. We have her uh, two uh, elder brothers. We have the Cardinal, one of her brothers, and Ferdinand is another uh, brother. They happen to be older or elder than her. We have, uh, <coughs> I mean, courtiers and stewards. We have Busola or Busola, uh, you know, whichever pronunciation you like would like to use we have Antonio we have Delio we have Julia but these are uh, the most 
uh, important uh, characters that we have uh, in in the in the play. Um, <clears throat> what else? The setting, like I said, is um, some in 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 a dupe them by the name of Malfi. <clears throat> uh, and the time is um, it, it's uh, a bit earlier to the Elizabethan and the Jacobian age, but not very far away from that period. Okay, so let's talk about the aim of the chapter or the aims rather. What is it that we're trying to communicate to you? What is it that we're trying to teach you uh, in chapter three? So uh, we, we're trying to introduce you to the treatment of the theme of love in Acts 1 and 2 of John Webster's play, The Duchess of Malfi, along with some consideration of the theme of death. So this is, this is normally the, the book strategy. We uh, normally <clears throat> have a whole chapter um, you know, focusing on an item or a number of items and then preparing us to the upcoming chapter by introducing, uh, um, you know, the, um, the, um, the chapter, I mean, the items of the new chapter, but in uh, perhaps in a rushed or in a hurry way, leaving the details to the new chapter. So um, the focus would be on the theme of love in Act 1 and 2, and then um, introducing the theme of death because um, the theme of this will be dealt with in the upcoming chapter. We're going to also examine other related themes and concerns of Act 1 and 2. It's, it's not only about love, um, it's going to also be about government, good governance, what makes uh, a good government a good one. We're going to have uh, some kind of uh, comparisons between the royal court of France and that of Malfi, and we're going to be introduced to, uh, I mean, the ideals of a good government, what makes um, a good royal court or a good royal court. Um, so examine other related themes and concerns of Act 1 and 2 provide you with practice in textual analysis. So the, this is what we're doing all the time. We are analy uh, analyzing the plays. And this is called textual because we're analyzing the text. Uh, it is true that we refer back to uh, the age and uh, we set the events against the uh, events in the age. But our primary focus would be on analyzing the text itself. OK. Uh, this is called textual analysis. And then we're going to consider some of the historical uh, contexts of the play. Um, historical context means the background of the age, what, what used to happen in the age. Uh, and of course, uh, we're not referring to the, um, the context or the historical context of the Malfi court. We're referring to the historical context of the Elizabethan and the Jacobian age. I mean, the play was written in the Jacobian age, and it and it addresses uh, Jacobian and English concerns. Okay, so it is true that the characters' names are foreign, the plot is foreign, but the play is rooted in the events of the uh, Jacobian and the Elizabethan age. Okay. So John Webster was born in 1580 and he died in 1634. And like I said, he was uh, one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, uh, though he was 16 years uh, younger uh, than Shakespeare. Um, again, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, John Webster has a reputation uh, for plot. I mean, his plays are all uh, about you know revenge and revenge tragedies, uh, and of, if we talk about revenge and re revenge tragedies, we talk about uh, blood letting and blood shedding. So uh, plenty of blood, 
that is the only writing he asserts. He is obviously uh, a reference or is a reference to uh, John Webster. So Webster's reputation for writing dark and violent plays is um, always uh, foregrounded. Uh, people know that he is, uh, whenever his name uh, is mentioned, uh, these are the associations uh, that come readily to mind whenever we talk about uh, John Webster. It's all uh, bloodletting and bloodshed, revenge, revenge tragedies. Uh, we will also consider uh, the reasons why the play has such prominence. Even in the 21st century, people still pick it up and read it and they seem to have the same fascination that uh, its original audience uh, had. So it, it, it's a phenomenon and we're more or less going to explore it. <clears throat> so the Duchess of Malfi does indeed have plenty of blood, like we said. And it is, in this sense, it is similar to Othello. Othello also had uh, um, uh, blood and uh, if Othello has uh, a great deal of blood and the Duchess of Malfi has a great deal of blood it means that this is perhaps was unusual in the uh, Renaissance um, or in Renaissance or Renaissance tragedies it seems that this was um, you know the fashion or the trend uh, at the time so like Othello, Webster's play is a tragedy about um, a forbidden love, more specific, uh, specific spe I'm sorry, specifically a forbidden marriage. So why is it forbidden? Because again, if you still remember when we talk about Othello, um, uh, Othello's marriage was cross-racial. I mean, he tried to, um, you know, go beyond uh, boundaries and he tried to reach out to somebody who is not, uh, who, or who does not belong to his race, uh, this Dumont. Okay, in our case, uh, that's why, I mean, his marriage or their marriage was forbidden, was forbidden uh, in terms of race. This time around, we're talking about um, a couple who also whose marriage uh, is also for, forbidden but not because of race but rather because of class the fact that the Duchess of Malfi belongs to um, a high class while her husband Antonio belongs to a lower class he is low born and she is um, she is the queen of the land uh, that's why uh, in the eyes of the society uh, of the time this is forbidden marriage and if you have forbidden marriage you have uh, uh, dire uh, consequences and this is actually what is going to happen as you, you're going to see so again uh, like Othello, Webster's play is a tragedy about a forbidden love, more specifically a forbidden marriage, which leads ultimately to the death of, of the lovers and many others. While, uh, Shakespeare, while Shakespeare's focus in his tragedy of love is race, Webster's is class or rank. So he focuses on the idea of race, uh, I'm sorry, on the idea of class or rank. So at the center of the Duchess of Malfi stands a heroine rather than a hero and this is also uh, quite an innovation to have a tragic heroine rather than a tragic hero was quite new uh, to the age. I mean, uh, to my recollection uh, it never happened before that you have uh, um, a heroine rather than a hero uh, in, in a play. So this was quite an innovation at the time. So at the center of the Duchess of Malfi stands a heroine rather than uh, a hero. 
which is fairly unusual in uh, Renaissance tragedy. Okay. <clears throat> what other barrels and correspondence do we have between the two play? The play also contains a villain who is very similar to Iago and Othello. So again, the basic tenet of the play, the, the basic idea would be uh, um, um, how um, the basic tenet of the play and the basic tenet even of the chapter uh, would be uh, to examine how Webster represents his heroine's marriage for love, which goes against the wishes of her uh, aristocratic family with disastrous consequences. So we're having uh, a female character who is um, yani going against against the, wish, the wishes of her um, aristocratic family and this is and she's not going to go away with it obviously okay so in terms of the book plan for chapters 3 and 4 chapter 3 will focus mainly on act 1 and 2 and chapter 4 on Acts 3 to 5. So as you can see, this is a linear uh, arrangement. Okay, so we're moving straight to Act 1, where Webster is setting the scene. Remember, you shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we're talking about love and marriage. So you need to ask yourself when is uh, when is talk about marriage and love going to take place? Is it going to be the first lines or what? To perhaps our surprise, we're going to find that the um, uh, talk about love and marriage, um, the encounters of lovers is going to happen much later uh, uh, and towards the end of act one. Uh, to be more specific, uh, they started to talk about love and marriage. We started to have the Duchess of Malfi wooing and courting her lover Antonio uh, towards the end of Act One, in uh, starting with line uh, perhaps uh, 360, which is way late. Um, uh, does it? Do we have specific reasons uh, when we explore the reasons for that? Uh, we would say that, that perhaps um, the enormity of what is going to happen on account of this kind of forbidden uh, love and forbidden marriage would uh, um, uh, prompt uh, Webster to kind of build suspense and build excitement uh, among the spectators and the audience. So that's why he is delaying uh, scenes of love until later, until he introduces you uh, to the social and the political uh, context in which the play uh, takes place and uh, in which uh, those themes and those ideas of love and marriage uh, will unfold. Uh, remember, um, uh, this is obviously a usual and a normal technique among playwrights. Whenever they want to highlight certain themes and ideas whenever they want to foreground certain characters and the features of certain characters they don't bring them on the stage right from the very start they keep them hidden from us and members of the audience until later so that they create the right atmosphere for for them so that when they appear you uh, you will have already uh, been given, uh, um, you know, enough uh, information and enough background about them. <clears throat> okay. So, um, Act 1, which is typically um, setting the scene for the events and the incidents in the play, 
uh, the representation of love in the Duchess of Malfi begins in earnest with the Duchess courtship and marriage courtship of and marriage to her steward Antonio again does this happen right away no this is also a major dramatic uh, climax the event which drives the action of the rest of the play this is the whole I mean this is the idea that the whole uh, fabric of uh, of the play uh, is built on yet it's in spite of the fact that this is a major if not the major event uh, it does not take place until the end of act one for like I said for explicit reasons we spoke about the reasons so the Duchess wooing of Antonio does not even begin until we are uh, three uh, in line um, you know 365 in the play why do we have to wait such a long time for this crucial episode? Uh, I mean, members of the audience would ask, readers would ask. And what, what is being achieved by structuring the scene in this way? Is it haphazard? Is it random? No, it's not. It's planned. Um, clearly, by the time the marriage unfolds on stage, we are in position of a good deal of information about the dramatic world in which it is taking place so you need you need background before introducing uh, these uh, people and before introducing their marriage their wooing and their courtship and their uh, subsequent marriage so it seems that webster is providing us with a dramatic context which against which uh, to respond to the representation of love <clears throat> and marriage okay so again we're not expecting them in the first scene we're, we're not expecting um, you know two lovers and they are uh, exchanging vows of love um, which is typical of uh, love relationships no um, um, we are starting with a political scene a political scene where there is talk about courts royal courts in Europe a royal court in France and a royal court in Malfi and there is a, a great deal of comparison between the two so uh, we're talking about courts ideal and real okay so ideal means we're talking about what a, a royal court should look like and real uh, means that we're talking about whether the um, courts that we have are really ideal or not do we have realities on the grounds that are different and that fall short of the ideal royal courts or, or not but this is um, the basic idea in this scene where we have Antonio and Delio uh, and Antonio and Delio uh, are more or less like courtiers courtiers means uh, people who work in a royal court they are courtiers and they are especially Antonio are low-born this is how we describe them low-born means that they are not aristocratic they were not born into nobility they are they were not born um, you know uh, as aristocratic people I mean they are uh, from obviously the common run but they perhaps dis distinguished themselves uh, themselves and they became stewards and courtiers in the court again it's um, Antonio and Delio and we get to know that um, obviously Antonio was on a mission in France uh, he, he, he just came from France and Delio is talking to him about um, the royal court in France and they like I said they are um, they are going to engage in some kind of comparison between the royal court of France uh, and uh, and the royal court 
of Malfi, of course, in favor of the former, uh, in favor of the royal court of France. So what is it that Antonio is going to say about the court of France? He's going to say very nice stuff. He's going to say that the, uh, the king over there is judicious and judicious means that he is very wise and he knows how to choose his counselors and advisors and uh, somehow he could uh, uh, dismiss uh, um, those uh, bad counts counselors he doesn't listen to flatterers and he uh, he could cleanse his royal court of uh, uh, flatterers and uh, you know, uh, he could cleanse his royal court of you know uh, you know, good for nothing courtiers and advisors um, again you talk about that the, the, there are going to be um, some indirect uh, references to both the court of Malfi and also to the uh, court and the English uh, royal court of James the first as we're going to see so again the play opens with an exchange between Antonio and his friend Delio and by the way you're going to see those encounters repeated between Antonio and Delio and uh, in the eyes of some critics, Antonio and Delio can be considered as chorus. And the role of members of the chorus uh, generally would be to uh, kind of comment on events and give you the moral, the moral of, of the scene or the moral of the encounter. And this is typically what is happening here. Uh, where Antonio is giving us, is sharing with us his experience in the Royal Court of France um, and the excellent experience that uh, uh, he sees uh, or he saw over, over there and in an indirect way he is telling us that uh, obviously what is happening in Malfi and by extension in England uh, is far away from the ideal that we have in the court of France. Hello? Somebody is saying that he cannot hear. I don't know why. Can you all hear me? Type 1 if you can hear me. Okay. So whoever cannot hear me, because I can, I can see that uh, everyone can hear me. If we have uh, you know, uh, an individual or two who cannot, please go out and come back. Can you type this? Because obviously if they cannot hear me, they wouldn't be able to. So type for them. If you cannot hear me, please go out and then come back, and that would solve the problem. <clears throat> Okay, good. So back to uh, Antonio and Delio and their exchange, which is going to be exclusively about, um, you know, uh, the, the French court, the French royal court. So Antonio admires the French court for its lack of corruption. So the French court does not have corruption. The judicious or wise king, having banished all flatterers and people of bad character or reputation. But this is what? Why they don't have corruption over there? Because their king is judicious and wise and he could dismiss all flatterers and people of bad character or reputation. Um, also, the king considers this cleansing of his court to be divinely inspired. He believes that this is an, uh, I mean, this is commissioned by God. God is ordering him to cleanse and clean his court of flatterers. 
So it's God's work rather than his own. He is only, uh, um, you know, acting out the will of God, if you like. Um, and there is always this comparison, or there is always this idea that if the court is good and healthy, the entire country will be good and healthy. So, uh, this is because of the enormous influence the royal court has on the entire country. The court that is healthy has a benign and good influence, while the court, uh, um, the corrupt one, the um, corrupt royal court, infects the whole land, which is more or less true. Um, Antonio then asks what the source is of this place. So, uh, Antonio is going to describe this government back in France as placed, placed government, and he is, as you can see, is using religious register. He's using words that are, uh, um, that are exclusively religious, which gives you the, the, the sense and the feeling that, um, you know, um, when, when royal courts are doing, um, a good job they are acting out the will uh, of God and this also may uh, take us to the idea of the divine rights of kings the fact that uh, um, at one point uh, there was this belief that uh, kings um, when they rule they are representatives of God on earth okay so Antonio then asks what the source is of this placid government that he found in France and answered that it is the king's wise and truthful counselors. He surrounds himself with good and honest counselors who rather than flattering him, the king I mean, gave him candid and truthful advice about the state of the nation. Okay, so, so as you can see it's all political. Okay, it's all about the um, the king of France and his um, good uh, government, good counseling. So again, we also took uh, or um, addressed the idea that if the royal court is healthy and good, this would extend to the rest of the, the country. So uh, Antonio then opens the play with a statement of how important the royal court is to the well-being of the nation as a whole. Yes. Um, while um, in engaging in this discussion and this uh, exchange about the French royal court, uh, Antonio is going to pick up the analogy of the common fountain. You know what a fountain is. A fountain would be, um, I mean, in the past, they wouldn't have faucets and water taps that, that we have in, in our houses now. So in order for people to have water, whether to drink or to do the other daily uh, stuff, they would go to a common fountain and they take water from it. So it's in the interest of everybody that the fountain is kept clean, right? So what happens if the fountain is, uh, I mean, has insects and ha has all these kinds of uh, bad, um, you know, creatures on and around it? Would you, would you go and drink from it? Would you go and take water uh, from it? Obviously, no. So it's very important that the common fountain uh, from which uh, people have uh, their water, it is very important that it is kept clean. Uh, so Antonio is saying that the common fountain is, is, is exactly like the royal court. So if the royal court is clean, uh, if the royal court does not have flatterers and bad counselors and advisors, so the whole country is going to be healthy and good. 
the royal court is like a common fountain that should be kept clean uh, if the royal court which is like the common fountain is poisoned the whole country is going to get poisoned are you getting the idea okay so how can you keep the royal court clean like a common fountain by dismissing flatterers by uh, dismissing corrupt officials uh, by um, um, I mean having good advisors so the common fountain from which every one drinks should be pure but if it is poisoned that is to say corrupt it spreads its contagion throughout the land everybody gets infected and obviously this is bad news so again as you can see the whole idea here is about the dire or the bad consequences of having a degenerate court and degenerate court means corrupt and good for nothing royal court again we're stressing the fact that Antonio uh, in his enthusiasm for the French royal court is using religious register um, equating what the king uh, is doing back there with uh, you know acts of God uh, with uh, religious acts this guy is obviously on a mission uh, fulfilling the um, the words of God if you like so that's why he's saying the work of heaven uh, uh, placid government so as you can see the register is leaning towards the religious as you can see so the fact that Antonio speaks about a royal court in a religious register uh, reminds us that in early modern uh, England doctrine, doctrines uh, like the divine right of kings um, it reminds it reminds of uh, us of these uh, doctrines or these beliefs uh, this belief the, um, the belief uh, in the fact that uh, I mean kings are you know uh, elected and appointed by God and that um, you know kings are uh, God's representative is has has been uh, or had been common at the time so uh, lots of people believed especially uh, the rulers they would say that we are God's representative on earth and and they would use and abuse it uh, obviously uh, immediately after we have uh, um, this kind of exchange or conversation between Delio and Antonio on uh, how good the French uh, royal court is we have we are hit with um, also talks and reporting about what is happening in the Malfi court which is obviously uh, uh, will come as a surprise and as a shock uh, for us because it's going to be way uh, off the mark uh, we have we have now established an ideal in scene one uh, we have established um, good practices royal good practices now we're going to see whether the Malfi court is observing those good practices or not so we have the ideal which is the French royal court and now we're going to go and check whether this is or check whether this is happening on the ground in uh, the Malfi court okay and see we're going to see how far uh, the ideal and uh, the reality are um, um, any kind of um, you know whether they correspond whether they meet uh, or not so what do we have after this encounter we have Busola 
and Busola happens to also be a courtier uh, and he is also like Antonio and Delio uh, law board um, and through the revelations of Busola and the, the railings and the lashing out that he is uh, um, engaged in we get to know how corrupt the Malfi court is so what happens next uh, first Busola enters followed by the Cardinal and their conversation at the very least makes us suspect that what Antonio observed in France is conspicuously lacking in Italy so through the revelations and their conversation we get to know that uh, there is obviously a big gap between the uh, ideal royal court in France and the royal court in Malfi Uh, okay, so um, obviously we have a brief encounter between co the Cardinal and Busola and then when they leave, uh, Delio will talk to Antonio about Busola and he's going to tell him that I knew, the, I knew this fellow seven years in the galleys. Galleys is obviously prison for a notorious m murder. I mean, the fact that he was kept in prison for uh, seven years for a murder that he committed and it was thought the cardinal support the the cardinal knew about it and he uh, he he was behind it so so the cardinal here is royalty like you can see he is a member of the royal family and like we said busola is a low born uh, courtier or steward so uh, if you compare this uh, uh, to what is happening in the French royal court, uh, obviously, uh, you can um, get the idea that uh, the Malfi court is corrupt. If one member of the royal family is commissioning uh, um, uh, one of the courtiers to go and uh, commit a murder, obviously, we have um, um, corruption and we have issues. So we quickly grasp that in this drama, the powerful, far from surrounding themselves with wise and candid counselors, hire men to commit crimes on their behalf. And this is exactly what the Cardinal did, right? So the enormous gap separating the French ideal from the Italian reality is driven home a bit later in the scene when Ferdinand, Ferdinand is the other brother of the uh, Duchess, when Fr Ferdinand, the Cardinal's brother and Duke of Calpria reproaches two of his assembled courtiers for bluffing and is going to tell him, you do my bidding. If, if I ask you to do this, do this. If, uh, if, if I take fire, uh, I mean, uh, you should be my touch would take fire when I give fire okay which means um, as my courtiers and advisors you only give what uh, pleases me you don't be I mean is uh, asking them not to uh, in an indirect way of course not to be honest with him if they see issues and problems they should keep their uh, their mouth shut they shouldn't say uh, listen we need uh, uh, you need to change this, you, you need to do that. No, he doesn't want them to say that. He, he wants them to only follow and obey him, uh, which is good, which is obviously not, not good consultation or not good advising. As an advisor, you should give uh, true and honest advice, even if it's going to hurt the one that you're advising, right? So we could hardly have a clearer indication of how far the Italian courts fall short of the fixed order described by Antonio. In place of a rational prince advised and guided by honest advisors, we have a prince who surrounds himself with courtiers whose sole purpose is to flatter his ego. Okay. Uh, 
uh, with their obsequious behavior. Again, so it might seem that these guys are making a comparison between the Royal Court of France and the Royal Court of Malfi uh, uh, when it, it, it is also clear that, that there are indirect references to what was happening in the court in the English court uh, or in the English Royal Court of James the first okay James the first court had also issues has corruptions and in, and in spite of the fact that James the first might like what is being said about corrupt courts he himself and his court were corrupt he himself because of his extravagance and uh, his overwhelming sense of spending and overspending he had to uh, kind of um, sell uh, honors I mean you normally get honors like uh, I mean royal uh, titles like uh, Lord uh, or sir through merit you do something you, you, you make an achievement and uh, the king comes and honors you by giving you this uh, royal title okay so it doesn't happen because you give them money obviously so what happened in, in, in the court of uh, James the first was that they were selling uh, these titles because of their uh, need, their dire and desperate need for money. So why would they need money? Because uh, James the first was very extravagant. He used to spend lavishly on trivial matters. So, uh, in reality, James James's court was infamous for its uh, uh, pro, uh, fl uh, extravagance, extravagant spending too much on unnecessary stuff, and corruption. He himself showered his f favorites with money, offices, and privileges. So, James's extravagance contributed to a constant need for money that he satisfied in part by selling titles of honor like uh, knighthoods and uh, peerages if you want to be a peer or a knight or a sir or a lord you pay for that so such titles in james's court were up for grabs by anyone with, with sufficient money to pay for them you see Am I making sense so far? Do you, do you guys have any questions? <clears throat> okay. Um, and we have... Uh, uh, so as you can see, uh, James uh, Court has been or uh, or was uh, a hot bed of uh, plotting and intrigue, um, uh, along with corruption and um, the selling of titles and offices and all these kinds of things. And we go to the character of Busola. Um, and Busola is normally referred to as the malcontent. The malcontent is, if you look at the word malcontent, if you check it up, it's about somebody who is not satisfied with what he has in life, obviously. And uh, the malcontent is also lashing out at society why why is this why is that why am, am i not given what i think i deserve um, so busola is going to play this role 
and this is by the way uh, uh, the um, the rule of the mal content is always there in revenge tragedy this is actually one of the features of revenge tragedies you always have uh, this kind of character we have seen him um, uh, perhaps with a lesser degree in Othello with the character of Iago uh, though Iago is different because Iago is not philosophical uh, Iago is a self-confessed rogue he doesn't have he's malignant for sometimes for no obvious reasons and his reasons are not are very personal you get get me past uh, uh, over for a promotion for I hate you uh, I suspect that there is something wrong between you and my wife I hate you but he doesn't talk about the, the good of Venice for example he's not doing what he is doing uh, um, with Venice uh, interests in mind uh, with um, Busola it's different Busola for all the degradation that he represents for all the corruption that he stands for he still has good redeeming points he has the welfare of the government and the whole uh, the welfare of the entire country uh, in mind as we're going to see in a minute uh, would you like to go and pray for five minutes and then we continue?
Hello, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Can you hear me? Are you guys back? Okay. Okay. So I, I think we're back. Type one if you can hear me. Another one if you can see me. Okay. 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 So um, before the prayers, before the prayers break, I was talking about the character of Busola, and I said that he uh, is uh, he is um, I mean his character is a constant when it comes to revenge trial. Whenever you have a revenge tragedy, you have this constant element of the malcontent, and the malcontent is a character who rails against. Uh, uh, the other characters uh, and the entire society for flaws and foibles he sees uh, uh, in uh, the society. He uh, exposes the ills and the evils of society. Uh, whether this is happening, this is what we're going to see in a minute. Whether he is uh, faithful in what he is uh, pointing out or whether he has um, um, you know, sometimes you have people who uh, do not uh, practice what, what they preach. They can be talking about evil and corruption, and they themselves are entangled uh, uh, and are uh, entangled in and part of uh, uh, the corrupt or the corruption network. Okay, let's see what Busola represents and whether he is true to what ideals he is preaching or not. So in placing the action of uh, his uh, play within a corrupt uh, courtly setting, Webster is also adhering to one of the main conventions of the dramatic genre uh, to which the Duchess of Malfi is usually thought to belong. So what, what is this um, dramatic genre that we're referring to? We're talking, of course, about the revenge tragedy. <clears throat> Uh, the revenge tragedy, like we said, is an enormously popular genre in the 16th and the 17th century in England. Uh, and we have so many examples. We have, for example, Thomas Kitts the Spanish uh, tragedy in 1587. We had uh, Hamlet, the very famous uh, play by uh, William Shakespeare. Uh, we, we also have Thomas Middleton's The Revenger's Tragedy, um, very famous. It was written in 1606. And with all these tragedies, revenge tragedies, um, we, also we, we always have uh, 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 the idea of decadent courts and irresponsible if not criminal rule, rulers. I mean, the rulers in these plays are corrupt and the courts are decadent. And there is always reference to the deficiencies of the status quo. Uh, um, and, at this, uh, and of course, there is always uh, this character who exposes this uh, uh, status quo, uh, wanting to change it. Uh, which is the character of the uh, malcontent, like I said. Uh, the malcontent, which is, like I said, is one of the elements or the characteristics uh, uh, of the revenge tragedy, is a character who is, who is consumed with disgust at the corruption and stupidity of courtly society and who, who vents his spleen by railing against it. Hamlet did that in, in, in the play by the same name. And we're having Busola playing this uh, role in the Duchess of Malfi. Uh, to the extent that Antonio is referring to Busola as a court uh, goal. A goal is more or less like a sword that you have uh, uh, if um, the body is sick, sometimes you have sores all over, and he, is, he happens uh, uh, to be one of them. Whether Antonio is talking 
uh, about um, about busolo in, in a positive sense here or negative this is also one of them but uh, uh, most likely he is referring to the fact that he is one of the swords himself he is uh, one of the the issues or uh, w with the body if if we think of the the country or the court um, in in terms of the analogy of the sick body so uh, Busola is going to be one of uh, those sources of, of pain he is a contributing factor more or less um, so Busola is referred to as a sore uh, which is uh, I mean well, um, you know uh, and typical of source they are produced by rubbing which means that there is a great deal of action and interaction corrupt as they are um, and Busola's um, Antonio is also alluding to Busola's fondness for, fondness for railing uh, and lashing out at the court I mean attacking the court uh, and tormenting it with his verbal abuse I mean he's not obviously happy with what happens with the court the contradiction here is that um, Busola himself is used as an element uh, um, through which corruption is made possible remember um, the ar agreement that that uh, we started the play with and he had an agreement with the cardinal he did he, he murdered somebody and he went to prison for seven years and this was uh, at the request of the current so he he is entangled in and enmeshed in corruption himself so typical of uh, the role of the malcontent when we meet Busola for the first time we're going to see him attacking the cardinal and Ferdinand for presiding over a courtly environment where loyal service reaps no reward only flattering uh, panders prosper this is what he says that those guys are you know um, they work within a system that is corrupt to the core a system that does not appreciate or respect loyal service if you're loyal if you're doing your job in, in an excellent manner this wouldn't concern them what concerns them according to Busola would be flatterers those who flatter uh, them <clears throat> and he would uh, compare them and compare what they are doing to plum trees you can have uh, plum trees which is obviously uh, a good uh, a good things these are trees after all but somehow uh, those plum trees grow crooked over standing pools okay so you have a standing pool okay uh, like a pond full of water but the water does not change the pool is a standing pool where water does not change so if water does not change what happens to it does it remain fresh does it remain drinkable does it remain healthy no it doesn't okay and then you start to see creatures of all types yani moving around and is on 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 this standing uh, pool which is obviously not a good thing right so this is what he is saying the royal court as managed and run by the cardinal and Antonio is a standing pool uh, on top of the pool are flatterers uh, and other uh, corrupt individuals okay like I said he is saying that plum trees can be rich and overladen with fruit 
but again they stand over stagnant water okay water does not change it's stagnant and this means that only uh, you know bad uh, insects and creatures like pies and caterpillars and crows um, they flourish over there again you can always compare the standing pool that uh, uh, Busola is talking about to the common fountain that Anton Antonio is talking about uh, earlier here in this case in the case of Busola, we have a standing pool where only uh, uh, you know bad creatures uh, any kind of uh, feed on like the parasites in the Malfi uh, royal court only parasites uh, only courtly parasites are allowed to flourish under the Cardinal and Ferdinand So as you can see, he he has he is showing his contempt to uh, the corrupt uh, court of the Malfi. Uh, could I be one of their flattering panders? I would hang on their ears like a horse leech. It's very strange. You are lashing out against them, and you wish that you you be one of those. Uh, parasites that you're talking about so what is it that you want so this is the contradiction that we have in the character of Busola he is practicing um, you know uh, I mean he is preaching good behavior and good governance and lashing out the, uh, at the corruption of the Malfi court but at the same time he is saying that if I am part of this network of parasites, I would, uh, I mean, suck the blood of of, of Ferdinand and uh, and the cardinal. Uh, okay, like a horse leech. See, see how contradictory he is. So could I be one of their flattering pandas? I would hang on their ears like a horse leech till I were full and then drop off as you can see so uh, how similar are they I mean Antonio and Busoda do you think that they are similar yes they are similar the fact that they they are low born um, the fact that they have they have obviously uh, uh, a reform program or a reform agenda if you like uh, whether they are going to sus sustain this interest and this enthusiasm for reform is another uh, issue so like Antonio Busola is low born and therefore entirely dependent for material success on the patronage of his social betters is low born and there is no way he can avoid uh, you know trying to appeal to his social betters in the royal court so that he can survive okay so as you can see he is also bringing to the fore the idea of rewards you get rewarded by toadying rather than merit it's not merit that uh, um, that gives you uh, promotion and rewards it's not merit it's flattering other people it's being corrupt <clears throat> Uh, let's look at how Antonio looks at Busola, whether he believes that he is a genuine reformer uh, uh, or uh, he's just another, uh, you know, uh, individual who, uh, who does not practice what he preaches. So Antonio has already given us his opinion of Busola when he says, 
yet I observe his railing, his attack or criticism, yet I observe his railing is not for simple love or piety. He's not pious. He's not, it's not that he is morally right and he's morally correct. He himself has issues. Indeed, he rails at those things which he wants, would be as lecherous, covetous, or proud, bloody, or envious as any man, if he had means to be so. Uh, he is trying to say, yeah, but uh, I mean, he is railing um, at the court and he is uh, criticizing. But if he is given the, the opportunity to be as bad as everybody else, I mean, to, to be uh, involved and to be part of them and to work for them, he, he would welcome the opportunity. So, uh, uh, as you can see, Busola is torn between an acute awareness of the social and moral deficiencies of the patronage system and a longing for social advancement. He is torn apart between these two. He wants reform, social and moral, but at the same time he, he also wants to, uh, to get promoted and to, to better and improve uh, his station in life. Um, if this um, betterment and improvement, if, if, if they are if they are to come uh, through uh, practicing things that he is against, he would do it. And this is this is the contradiction that we're talking about. So his vision of himself as a horse leech, greedily sucking the brother's blood until he drops off, captures something of his doubleness. He is uh, doubleness here means contradiction. He ha he is self-contradictory how come you are uh, preaching reform uh, and how how come you are anti-corruption but you are ready at hand to be part of this boys net or network if you like to be part of this corrupt network so uh, as you can see he may despise the yes men who thrive in the courtly milieu but at the same time he wants to share in the material prosperity they enjoy okay is that clear everyone okay and 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 then comes the idea of marriage and the idea of marriage for love. Remember, when I talk about marriage for love, I cannot help but remember what what happened with Othello and Desdemona, and what we said about uh, the concept of love at the time. How the uh, people in the Elizabethan age uh, used to look at the idea of marriage. Remember when we spoke about marriage, and we said that marriage was more or less like uh, um, a transaction uh, between families. Uh, it's, it was economic and social, uh, right? Uh, and political uh, exchange between two families um, in which the couple ha has, yeah, have nothing to do with. They don't have a say uh, in, uh, in this uh, deal. It's a, it's a deal, more or less. This is happening here also where obviously the society here in Malfi and what the Malfi represents, I mean the Jacobian age, uh, obviously they have no, also they have no respect for the idea of love. So marriage for them is also, uh, um, you know, again it's a transaction. Um, where love is not part of the deal at all. Okay, so when uh, the Cardinal and uh, Ferdinand um, act against the marriage that the, their sister uh, will uh, have, it's not because she, she is going to get married 
it's not because she is a widow and they they, they are uh, perhaps uh, having their eyes set on her wealth and um, uh, um, it's it's not because this is forbidden marriage because of the difference in rank and class it's also because they don't believe in marriage uh, that is based on love for them there is no such thing as um, marriage for love you just get married and we as your elders uh, I mean arrange everything you just get married okay so again they have every reason to oppose this uh, kind of marriage or this kind of union uh, um, again if you think of why they oppose it uh, you would think of how they look at the idea of marriage for love they don't believe in it like the other members of society marriage for, for them is a deal political economic okay um, this marriage for them is also forbidden because it's it's a, a, a cross class marriage which they don't approve of there is no such thing uh, for them as uh, um, I mean a cross class marriage where uh, you are on a certain class and you're uh, the one that you're getting married to is in another class no they, okay so the <clears throat> the, the, the Dutch is if, if she wants to get married she has to marry uh, to somebody from within her rank uh, uh, Antonio, if he wants to get married, he has to marry from somebody from one within his rank, low born like him. But for them to uh, to marry each other is, of course, a no no. This is uh, another reason. This is, of course, together with their other uh, reasons uh, opposing this kind of marriage. The fact that they they are greedy, they want to uh, uh, to inherit their sister she, uh, if, if she gets married um, so the uh, <clears throat> she's going to um, legally she's she's going to uh, more or less legally report uh, uh, to her husband and her husband is going to win everything okay so they are uh, more uh, or less um, insecure about these things I mean they keep thinking about them and this is these are their driving motives this is what uh, is pushing them forward uh, opposing uh, this kind of marriage um, those uh, obsessions and those concerns turn into insecurities if you still remember when we spoke about Othello's insecurities uh, um, the uh, card uh, the cardinal and Ferdinand have their own insecurities and those insecurities happen to be the embodiment of the entire society's insecurities when it comes to uh, marriage uh, that is based on love marriage that is uh, marriage across the classes <clears throat> among other things So having all t uh, alerted us to the autocratic and criminal uh, pr propensities of the Cardinal and Ferdinand, Webster goes on to inform us in the opening uh, scene of their opposition to the idea of their wedded sisters remarrying. So we are in front of a widow, and this widow is remarrying and she is a duchess it's very complicated as you can see so you have a widow and we're going to look at how they used to look at widows at the time okay she is a duchess she's not just another uh, only widow she is um, a widowed duchess and this is another uh, problem and she's a woman don't forget that and look uh, always at how women were treated at the time so they are suspicious they have insecurities um, in in every uh, level of the argument a woman 
wedded and a setting um, duchess or queen she is ruling actually so try to identify two reasons for the cardinals and Fernand's hostility to the prospect of their sisters marrying a second time why would they hate it that much do they have reasons they have reasons uh, on the level of representation if they they uh, they can be uh, um, I mean what I'm trying to say is that they represent society and society at the time was suspicious of women let alone if they are wedded women okay and there is a great deal of uh, you know, politics involved if it comes to the fact that this wedded individual this wedded lady uh, is also a queen or um, a setting ruler she rules so both brothers seem to be worried that their wedded sister will succumb to temptation and undertake a marriage that damages the family honor okay so why why would she damage the family honor I mean there is obviously nothing wrong with getting married for the second time right so for them to get married as a widow is obviously bad in and of itself which is very strange they also appear to be afraid that because she is a widow she is more likely to want to marry a second time so we're, we're talking about stereotypical uh, attitudes and ideas towards first women second wedded women Uh, and and their attitudes um, and their attempts at undermining this kind of marriage or marriage for the second time uh, reflect uh, and and tells us a great deal about early modern ideas about women and family honor. This is a big issue. Uh, their fears are in large part fueled by anxieties about female sexuality in general and of widows in particular and I'm not going to go in, yeah, in deep into that you can read it uh, on your own uh, suffice it to say that they they believe that um, widowed women are um, you know are gathering danger to their families and uh, and the and the honor uh, of these families this was the stereotype this was the prevailing value or attitude at the time and bad as it is negative as it is unfair as it is mind you so women in early modern england were widely thought to have a much <clears throat> Uh, uh, you know stronger uh, appetite than men and they were often feared uh, as untrustworthy so the bottom line is that they they don't trust them they believe that they can betray their husbands uh, uh, easily and we have echoes of that even in Othello uh, he had those ideas uh, remember at one and at one point he would exclaim saying oh a curse of marriage that we can call these delicate creatures ours women he means and not their appetites okay and again um, what do we call that we call we remember last time we spoke about that and we said this is mis 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 <laughs> Misogyny. Misogyny is when you have misogynistic attitudes towards men. You are a, ma a, a woman hater, and this is actually what is happening here. So widows were thought to be especially susceptible to this 
famine, vice. You cannot trust them. And another example would be the encounter. Yes, they were, yes, misogynist, yes. So um, another example of uh, would be the, the encounter between the Duchess and uh, the Cardinal uh, in which he tells her that widows vows never to remarry commonly, uh, uh, I mean, when they vow that they, they will never remarry. This would, I mean, wouldn't last too long, no longer than the turning of an hourglass. I mean, it means that their um, their vows just disappear after uh, a few hours of making those promises and those vows. Uh, and even even Ferdinand, uh, at one point he would refer to his sister, and when he talks to her, he says, uh, "Lusty widow," and of course you know what lusty means, and very uh, demeaning and very degrading. Another, um, so this is this is societal reasons that they represent and embody the fact that uh, society is suspicious of every move a widow may make, uh, every move a woman would make, okay, in the name of family honor and all these big phrases and words. Uh, another reason, another compelling reason for Ferdinand and the Cardinal would be the idea that legally, uh, if a woman is married, she is under uh, uh, the control of her, uh, legally, under the control of her husband. When uh, the husband dies, it's uh, it, she becomes under the uh, you know the control and the legal control of her uh, family, my brothers or, or or parents. So if she gets married again, she again goes to the control of another husband, and they are fearful of that because of uh, the legal. Uh, ramifications of that the fact that if she if she dies or something her husband is going to inherit everything including the uh, I mean the, the government so the fact that widows were not firmly under the control of their male relations intensified their ability to arouse masculine anxieties in this period, when a woman married, she moved from a position of legal subservience to her father to being legally subject to her husband. And this is, of course, would be very alarming to them. Um, another uh, reason would be, uh, I mean, for opposing the marriage, mind you, would be the idea that uh, perhaps she will marry beneath her class, and this is obviously a crime. Remember when we spoke about the idea of class fixity, the fact that you have to stick to your class? This is one of their insecurities and, and concerns. She might, if she decides to remarry, who knows, maybe she, she, she may get married to somebody beneath her, which is another uh, dishonoring <laughs> of the honor of the family, obviously. Okay, so cardinal, the cardinal says outright that what they fear is that their sister will marry beneath her. So she's high blood, and she should stay high blood. Okay, if we agree, and they obviously they don't. If we agree that you get married, you get married from within your ranks. We're fearful that you may get married beneath your class, which, which, uh, what she did, obviously. So 
So the cardinal's reference to the Dutch's high blood uh, smacks of class insecurity. She ha uh, they have this uh, insecurity. He is afraid that she will fall into the arms of a lower class man, which she did. <laughs> So according to him, uh, a cross-class marriage constitutes a tainting or corruption of the family's pure noble blood. See? So how do you find the play so far? Okay, interesting. That's that's nice. Okay. How similar is it to Othello? Uh, somebody is saying that it is frustrating. Ah, yes, they, they were. They were not open-minded at all. Yeah, somebody is referring to the fact that uh, uh, perhaps it got inspired, I mean, the Duchess of Malf Malfi got inspired by Othello, I mean, in terms of themes and ideas, yeah. Um, uh, it's not, I mean, they have common inspiration, your common source of inspiration, which is obviously the age and its mis misogynist uh, ideals and, uh, and ideas when it comes especially to uh, women and the poor and you know, sticking to your class and your race. These are ills and evils that were uh, prevalent in society. And somebody had to talk about them so that we can reach the stage where we are now, uh, where uh, in the English society you don't have that anymore. You have interracial marriages. Uh, you have the um, members of the royal family uh, foregoing their, their uh, privileges as uh, royalty and um, going down the social ladder and getting married to people from uh, ordinary people, right? So this is not happening um, uh, anymore. Uh, and if it does happen, it happens on a very uh, limited and, and a very small scale. Okay, I think I'll end... Uh, on this note and with this item and I'll give you two minutes for uh, questions before we call it a night any questions everyone So you you guys are silent, and I'll take it that you don't have questions. Um, we're, we're having a class tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, right? Is it tomorrow?
Okay. Bye. Okay, so I'll see you inshallah tomorrow. Until then, um, I wish you all the best. Assalamu alaikum. Bye bye.